All right, biology students, welcome back. This lesson is pretty exciting because this is the first lesson of our very last unit that we have in biology. So for our last unit, we are talking about ecology. Um, and we're going to talk about species and how they interact with one another in our biosphere. And then we're going to pull in a lot of the information that we've talked about this year in biology. And we're going to look at a lot of cause and effect relationships. This is one of my favorite units, and I think it will be one of your favorites as well. If you're following along, if you're one of my students and you're following along, you should have notes, um, doodle notes that you are filling in as we go through the lesson. Um, so feel free to pause the video at any point in time um, or rewind if you need to. All right, so we have different levels of organization within our biosphere. So as we sum up our biology course, of course, we would end with talking about our biosphere. So the biosphere is also known as the ecosphere, and it pretty much just sums up all the different ecosystems that exist on Earth. Now, within the biosphere, we can break it down into different biomes. So biomes are just groups of ecosystems that have similar climates. And you typically learn about this at the middle school level. So we're not gonna get into a lot of detail about specific biomes. You can see some examples here on the screen, um, but just know that biomes exist within the biosphere and biomes are ways that we sort of group ecosystems together that have similar climates. Now within those bones, we can find many different ecosystems. And this will sort of be the focus for our ecology unit. We're gonna really dive into some different ecosystems. We're gonna be looking at all the living and non-living components of that area. So when we're talking about ecosystems, we're talking about living and non-living. So if I look at this picture here, this is an aquatic ecosystem, a pond ecosystem. You see a lot of things going on. So um, we've got some living organisms, some things that we see, like some plants, some animals. And then of course, there's things that we maybe don't see like bacteria, fungi. Um, and then we we could talk about it in terms of the non-living components too. So we could talk about the salinity or the pH of the water. We could talk about the temperature here, the amount of sunlight that this ecosystem receives. Um, so when we're talking about the living and the non-living parts or components of an area, we are referring to an ecosystem. Now that's different from a community. So all the various populations living in an area that interact with one another, these make up the community. So a community is different from an ecosystem because in a community, we are solely focusing on the biotic components, so the living components. So if I'm looking at this aquatic ecosystem, um, I'm, I might talk about the turtles or the fish or the plants or the algae that, that grows here. Um, since all of those things are living, then I'm specifically referring to the community. Now a population or populations can be found within these communities and populations or a population is just a group of the same species and these um, groups are gonna be able to interbreed and interact with one another. Now, if I focus in on the species, so within a population, they're members of the same species, but if I'm referring to the actual species, we are talking about similar organisms which can interbreed and produce viable offspring. And what this means is those offspring will also be able to reproduce. Now ecology, since this is an intro to ecology lesson, we're gonna get a lot of vocabulary terms here. Again, feel free to pause the video at any point in time um, to grab any of the definitions or terms that you need. So since we're in ecology, you need to know what ecology is. So this is the study of the interactions among organisms and their environment. Again, an ecosystem is just where these interactions are gonna take place. And we have different types of ecosystems. Um, so we have ecosystems that can be terrestrial or aquatic, and I have a slide on that in just a second. I will um, pull that up for you so you can get those definitions down. Um, but within an ecosystem, we can have living and non-living components. So we refer to the living components as biotic factors. And then of course the non-living components 
treatments would be abiotic factors. So some great examples of abiotic factors might include the air, the water, temperature, sunlight, uh, the acidity of soil, the acidity of water, how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, how much carbon dioxide is in um, maybe maybe the water. Um, and so we're going to talk about a lot of abiotic factors and how they influence the ecosystems that they're part of. And then, of course, the biotic factors are the living components. These you're familiar with. So this would be like the plants and the protists and the fungi and the trees and the insects um, and all the living parts of the ecosystem. Uh, this is what I mentioned earlier. So we have different ecosystems that can exist within the biosphere. So you can have aquatic ecosystems. These are our water ecosystems. They're going to include oceans and lakes and rivers, the wetlands, estuaries. Uh, and then your terrestrial ecosystems are land-based. So these are going to include um, the tundra, taigas, uh, your rainforest, grasslands, deserts. We're going to talk about a lot of different terrestrial ecosystems in this unit. Large geographic areas with similar climates and ecosystems. Again, these are called biomes. Now, one term that we are going to hear in just about every lesson in this unit is the term biodiversity. So make sure you grab this definition and you know what it is from here on out. So biodiversity is the variety of organisms that can be found in the ecosystem. So all the stuff that's in the ecosystem, all the living things that make up an ecosystem. So if we are comparing the two ecosystems on your screen, um, how do they compare in terms of biodiversity? Hopefully you notice that the one on the left is what appears to be much more biodiverse than the one on the right. Um, now they all, both include biodiversity, but we've got a lot of stuff going on in the aquatic ocean ecosystem, the coral reef, um, and not a lot of stuff that we can see, not a lot of variety uh, in the desert ecosystem. So we would probably say that the coral reef ecosystem is more biodiverse than, say, the desert ecosystem. Now, an organism is any single living thing within an ecosystem. This should sound familiar to you because the very first lesson that I taught you this year um, had the same definition. So we were talking about an introduction to biology and we talked about organisms being living things. Um, and so we're circling back around. Just make sure you have that in your notes. Now, the actual place where these organisms can get their food and their shelter and have their needs met, this is called the organism's habitat. And then organisms will have a unique job or a role within their ecosystems. Um, sometimes this role is while the, the organism is alive, but sometimes, like with lichen, you can see here on the screen, its niche is actually found in the death of the organism. Um, but a niche is just a job or a role that an organism has within its ecosystem. And so in this example on the screen, you have lichen. Lichen can typically be found um, on some trees. You probably have seen this before. Um, and they just kind of exist on the trees in the forest. This is their habitat. Uh, but when they die, they contribute really good organic matter to the soil. This provides nutrients for plants and other organisms to grow in the forest. Um, and so that is the niche or the job or the role of the organism. Now, all organisms rely on other organisms for energy. We talked about this in our um, energetics unit. Uh, so a lot of the next few slides are going to be a review. But the transfer of energy from one organism to another is called energy flow through an ecosystem. And we can trace the path of how energy flows through an ecosystem with an energy pyramid. Um, and this just shows the different trophic levels. And what you should remember is that as we move up the pyramid, the amount of energy um, consumed is going to decrease. The amount of energy available is going to decrease as we move up. Now at the bottom of the trophic pyramid, you have your primary producers. So these are our autotrophs. These are our organisms that are going to create their energy from the sun, um, typically using photosynthesis. So these organisms make their own food. And then you have your consumers. And these organisms have to obtain or consume 
either producers or other consumers in order to obtain energy. Um, and so you see you have primary consumers next, and then the organisms that feed on primary consumers are known as secondary consumers. And then you uh, can move on up, you have your tertiary consumers, and at the very top of the trophic pyramid, you'll find your apex predators. Um, remember, we have the rule of 10, which states that as you move up from one trophic level to the next, only 10% of energy is again, that's available at one trophic level is going to move to the next trophic level. Again, that's called the rule of 10. Um, that other energy is lost as heat. There's, there's other ways that that energy is lost. Um, we'll talk about in the next slide. And then when these organisms die and decompose, um, they recycle the nutrients, which provides nutrients for the producers. And so it's sort of a circle. Um, and uh, we're gonna we will get into the math part of this a little later, um, but you should remember that from our energetics unit. So not all, we mentioned this earlier, not all of the energy generated or consumed in one trophic level is going to be available to organisms at the next trophic level. Um, only 10% is going to travel. Um, so 10% of the energy stored as biomass in a trophic level is going to be passed to the next level. Again, that's called the rule of 10 or the 10% rule. And what it does is it limits the number of trophic levels that an ecosystem can support. So we're going to see in some of the ecosystems we're going to look at throughout the unit, um, we're going to have some that are healthy ecosystems, some that are disrupted by something um, external, and we'll talk about what that does to the actual trophic levels within the ecosystem. Now we did mention that 10% moves but that leaves 90%. So where does this 90% go? Well, a lot of it is lost as heat, um, but some of the biomass is consumed um, or is excreted as waste. So the biomass is consumed and then excreted as waste. Um, and then some plants and animals just die without ever being eaten, um, meaning that their biomass is not passed to the next consumer. So altogether, this is sort of where the other 90% go. Now, organisms, we're going to talk about this. There will be a specific lesson on this, so I'm going to fly through this very quickly as an intro, um, and then we'll come back and kind of do a deep dive into symbiosis. But organisms, we're going to see within these ecosystems, they have very close relationships with one another. Some of these relationships are beneficial. Some of these relationships are harmful. Um, and so the relationship that organisms have, two organisms have between one another, is known as symbiosis. And so there's three forms of symbiosis that we're going to look at in this lesson. One is mutualism. Um, this is where both species are going to benefit. So both species are going to get some sort of benefit from the relationship. And then you can have parasitism. One organism in this relationship is going to benefit, it's going to be helped, but in the process, the other organism will be harmed or negatively impacted. Uh, and then you can have commensalism, which is where an organism benefits, but the other organism is neither harmed nor does it get a benefit. So let's look at some examples. So this image shows the relationship between bees and flowers, and it tells us that the bees benefit from the pollen and the nectar that they gather from the flowers, and the flowers are going to also benefit by the bees because the, or get a benefit from the bees because the bees are going to transport their pollen and pollinate other flowers. This helps with reproduction. So what type of symbiosis does this example represent? Hopefully you said mutualism. Mutualism because both the bee and the flower get a benefit. All right, in our next example, this image shows the relationship between some shark species and pilot fish. So pilot fish will feed on the leftovers in the water after a shark makes a kill. This does not harm the shark in any way, but it doesn't help the shark either. Um, so the pilot fish gets the benefit. The shark remains remains sort of unaffected. So what type of symbiosis is this? Hopefully you said commensalism because the pilot fish get the benefit, the other organism is unaffected. In our last example, we have the relationship between a mosquito and a human. So a mosquito is going to drink human blood for nutrients. It's going to, of course, um, deplete 
the human of some of those nutrients, and it's also going to leave behind a pretty nasty itch. So what type of symbiosis does this represent? Hopefully you thought parasitism because, of course, the mosquito gets the benefit and then its host, in this case the human, is going to be harmed. Now, throughout this unit, we're going to, um, the focus is going to be on relationships within ecosystems. And we're going to see that relationships exist among all living things. Uh, but when one thing in the ecosystem is out of balance, it can affect an entire ecosystem, even to the point of where we see a trophic cascade, which we'll talk about in a in a future lesson. Um, and I give an example here of pesticides. So pesticides are chemicals that can really uh, disrupt a delicate ecosystem. Um, and what they do is they can cause one population to soar and another to die out. And even though that population that dies out is sort of a nuisance, um, it does wreak havoc on these ecosystems. So if one component dies out, it can create a chain reaction that affects the other organis organisms in the ecosystem. And sometimes it's, that's to the detriment of the ecosystem. All right, here's where we're going to stop for today. If you're in class today, I'm going to show you this uh, little video clip. If you're not, though, this wraps up our lesson. Just make sure you go back and get any notes that you may have missed. Um, this was a pretty vocabulary intense lesson. So just make sure you grab all those important words and their definitions. And I will see you back here in the next lesson.